Welcome to Electric Evolution with Liz Allen. This podcast is about the journey to a more sustainable future in order for us to be able to do our bit to achieve net zero. I'll be discussing a variety of topics with experts in their field in order to educate and increase our knowledge of clean energy, electric vehicles and the electric vehicle infrastructure. So whether you're an individual wanting to make a difference at home, a small business or a corporate, this podcast is just for you. So today on the podcast, I have got I've got with me um, Harvey Leach, who is an operational excellence consultant at Veracity Oxford Limited. Um, we've known each other for a little while, but through uh, through a colleague called David Savage, name dropping there. <laughs> but nice to nice to meet you. Nice to kind of Likewise. meet you on here properly, Harvey. Likewise, Liz. Nice to meet you too. So we're kind of a little, we're sort of in the same, um, we work in the same field, don't we, me and you? But the difference between between what you do and what I do is I drive an, an, a petrol car and you're driving um, an EV, aren't you? Yes, I am. So we, we purchased our first electric car about this time last year, actually. So we've, we've it's just gone through its first MOT, no problem, and still absolutely loving it. Brilliant. And you've got a BMW i3, is that right? That's right, yes. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Now, so you've been self-employed for, for, for 18 years. Yeah. And But, you know, at what point during that self-employment did you start thinking of buying an electric car? Um, I think it was prob- probably a couple of three years ago um, because the diesel car I already had was starting to get a bit long in the tooth and so we started thinking about what would we replace it with Um, and the big concern really for us was what would happen on long journeys because particularly during COVID Mm -hmm. that's what caused us to really rethink was that during the pandemic almost every journey we were doing was short and local you know and the absolute worst thing for a diesel car is short journeys because it never warms up properly it's it's not very fuel efficient all of those things but yet i knew Mm. that there would still be the occasional long journey you know i'm not doing as much traveling as i did earlier in my consulting career because a lot of stuff has moved online and is likely to stay that Mm. way um and so we were thinking well what would what would work in both scenarios because the the biggest thing we were concerned about was how good the charging infrastructure would be um so that's kind of what really got us into to really thinking we we thought an ev was the right way to go but how would we how would we deal with that long journey Mm. scenario Yeah, yeah, and and so you did do a. You've done a few a few long journeys, kind of recently, haven't you? And we yeah. kind of spoke about it on LinkedIn a couple of yeah, times. Yeah, exactly. How, so, how did you manage with the whole yeah charging? Okay. So so the, the 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 reason we ended up going for the i three. Let me tell you that bit of the story first, and then I'll tell you about the long journeys because there's a a logical progression to the way our mm. thinking works. So. You know, a, a brand new okay. EV was not within our budget. Um, and we weren't convinced that was the right thing mm-hmm. to do anyway, because we wanted to experiment before we maybe committed ourselves mm-hmm. to something brand new. And so yeah, we yeah, were yeah. looking around at what was what was a, what was within our price range that looked like it would do the job. And if you if you wound yeah. that, you know, a year ago, the number of second-hand EVs you could buy that were anything other than a Renault Zoe or a Nissan Leaf was tiny, perhaps compared to what it is now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that was one factor. You know, we wanted something that would become our mo- our main car. Um, mm. And the BMW i3 looked like a good choice. We got a friend who'd got one who raved about it. One of my former... BMW colleagues was a real fan of the i3 and was telling me that's what I should go for. 
Um, but one of the challenges with the basic i3 was range. You know, even even the, the most recent ones have got a less than 200 mile range. And the one we ended up buying is an, is right, an EV okay. only has got a range like 100 to 150. But one of the neat things that BMW did mm. with the i3 was they kind of recognized this scenario. And so the one we bought mm. has actually got what they call a range extender, which is a tiny petrol engine that only kicks in yes. when you want it to. So it's not like a conventional hybrid where the petrol engine is doing most of the work. 90 plus percent mm. of the mm. time, you're driving it in pure electric mode. So round town, short journeys, right. if you can keep charging. But the petrol engine is like a get out of jail mm. card. If you find that for whatever reason, you can't find a charging point, you have this little petrol engine that will kick in and keep you going because um, it effectively works as a generator yeah. and tops up the battery um, or keeps the battery at the same state of charge. Right. To be clear. Um, so that's that yeah. was the key to to de-risking the long journeys because if you're on a if you're driving for pleasure and you're not in a rush you can afford the situation where you get to one charging point and it's busy and you have to wait um it's not a big deal if you're going on holiday mm. you know having to wait 20 minutes half an hour after somebody else charges the car is just an extra cup of coffee if you're doing a business critical trip yeah then time becomes more important and you know a year's mm -hmm. worth of experience with the charging infrastructure in this country says if you're traveling in the middle of the day chances are you're going to have to wait so the petrol engine was like the cushion for those time critical situations mm -hmm. where you get to the charger charge is busy i haven't got time to wait half an hour i'll just put the petrol engine on and carry on for a bit yeah so that, mm, mm. so that's kind of like why we ended up with the car we ended up with, and it's may it's taken a lot of the worry okay. out of long journeys away because I think that's the that's the big challenge is people worry about range, um, you know. And our logic yeah, was, do, yeah. how yeah. often do we do a really long journey that would need even you know that even needs a hundred mile range? Not very often, so. Yeah, I think a yeah. lot of it, a lot of the key is just rethinking what we think is a good range for a car, because on an EV you, you come home, you plug it in on your drive, assuming you're not you've got a drive that you can uh, put a charger on, and you're charging it every day. So the idea you've got to go to a petrol station suddenly goes out the window, and therefore you don't need that big fuel tank. Since we spoke, we spoke a couple of weeks back, didn't we? Yeah. And I've actually test driven a couple of. Um, a couple of EVs uh, this last weekend. I saw, and and it was really really interesting because um, I've got to say I was really nervous. I wrote a little post on LinkedIn um, over the weekend, yeah, and I was I was really really nervous at first because I don't think it, I think it was because I didn't know what to expect, and it's silly because I've been driving for years and it's not as if I'm um you know I'm an incompetent driver I'm a pretty good driver yeah you know, I always say I'm better than my husband but he doesn't drive much <laughs> <laughs> and um and actually I think I, think, <laughs> yeah, I know I think maybe but I had two ex two very different experiences and the and the first you know so I think some of it the nerves was were down to kind of maybe the experiences in the in the in the company that you you know going to test drive from yeah but um but i tr i um i test drove an mg4 um on friday and then i test drove a uh, cupra born on saturday now i'd been talking to a chap um recently called john burdekin who was talking to me about um uh, regenerative braking and, and 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 i'm assuming the i3's got regenerative braking yeah. has it yeah yeah. So, so that that was it wasn't um, it wasn't a shock, um, but it was a, it was a different way of managing the vehicle. Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so kind of I knew about it, and I got the lady who was taking me out for the first test drive to explain explain more about it. And actually, once I got used to it, 
it was fine. I think I found it easier in the second car in the Cupra Born. And I kind of put in this post as well that, that the, the roads around, you know, where I was driving was was kind of like I, I knew them. So it was it was a lot, lot different. But how how do you find using that kind of regenerative braking when you're on long journeys? Has it has it made a difference to you when you've been driving your I3? I, I mean, I, I think for me. One one pedal driving is brilliant once you get used to it. And it probably only took me the time it took to drive the car home to get used to the idea of it. Um, I think, mm. you know, the idea that you don't need to touch the brake pedals is a bit weird to start with, as I guess you've, you've just experienced. Yeah. yeah. Um, but once once you yeah, get very used much. to it, it is such a brilliant way of driving because, you, you know, it doesn't take that long to judge how much to lift off the accelerator pedal um to get the car to just naturally come to a stop and brilliant thing is a that's giving you electricity back in your battery which is brilliant and b you're not wearing out yeah. the brakes so you're saving on your maintenance costs you know i think yeah. i probably yeah. you know the number of times i use the brakes on the i3 is oh is minimal and it's only when either i've misjudged something or somebody's done something i wasn't expecting and I've had to stop quickly in day to day yeah. driving. You know, the yeah, ice, the ice, a lot of EVs have got you adjust the level of regen you get. Whereas the I3 has got this sort of speed yeah. sensitive regen that you can't adjust. So it means if you lift your foot off at high speed, the car doesn't stand on its nose because mm. it switches the regen on. Um, it just progressively brings the regen in as the car slows down which just feels, you know, as I say, once you get used to it, it feels really natural. Um, and I just find it a really nice way to drive. And I don't think the length of journey really matters too much because it's more useful around towns because once you're on the motorway, you're on the motorway um, and you're not braking anyway, hopefully. No, no, unless you've got some yeah, person exactly. who's being silly in front of you. Yeah. <laughs> It's funny, um, my, my son's just learning to drive at the moment and I've kind of, you know, I've sort of said to him, it's it's actually, it's not you that you need to worry about on the roads. Obviously, he needs to improve his confidence while he's learning to drive, sure. but it's actually other people on the roads that, you know, like you say, you've, you've got to look out for those people who are going to anchor on in front of you, yeah. don't, don't you, you know, who are going to do something. Oh. And I, I'm trying to get him to, he's having driving lessons with a proper teacher, not me, you know, yeah, a proper yeah. instructor. I but, those um, but actually, you always need, yeah, <laughs> you always need to look far enough ahead and be aware of everything that's going on around you, don't you? Yeah. You know, I mean, I've I've driven a lot over my over the years I've been working, and it's funny um, talking to my own boy about you know my son. I shouldn't call him a boy. He's he's, he's seventeen, so you know <laughs> yeah. he's not a boy anymore. But you know, actually talking to him about things like this because it's it's things that. Um, I've learned over the years, I don't want him to learn my bad habits, <laughs> you know, because I really don't. I say like driving at 10 to 2, remember, you know, um, rather than just one handed and your hand on the thing. Um, but, you know, it's it is all about it's it's different driving habits. And I can imagine that that you develop very, very different driving habits in an electric vehicle, don't you? I th Well, I think for me, learning to one pedal drive actually helps you to be more anticipating what's going on around you so i think it, it probably is re-educating you right. just the stuff you're trying to teach your son anyway that maybe we forget mm. um you know because because mm. there's there's almost this mindset that you're trying not to use the brakes because you think if i use the brakes that's energy i'm not getting back and so it's it's re-educating your anticipation. And I think that's been a really interesting thing. You know, it's almost like putting your foot on the brake mm. is a sign you've misjudged something most of the time. And that's quite good in terms of re-education. You've also, there's also other things that you've done at home, yeah. aren't there, to, to actually become more eco-friendly and kind of looking at your energy systems in the same way that, 
that, that you know that we're that we're doing that what we're trying to do at home or we're looking sure. to do at home can you just explain what those things are yeah so so in parallel with going to the electric car uh we have put solar panels on the roof of our house um mm. it took us a little while to make that decision um and with all the change in energy price of course mm. the price went up between when we thought about it and when we actually did it which was september this year um yeah. but we've now got a right. 16 panel array on the roof of the house which will generate us about on a nice warm sunny day about six kilowatts um but even in okay. the autumn on a good sunny day so say in october we were still peaking at five kilowatts for a reasonable amount of time of the day um and so that's okay. really good so what is that power it, that's power yeah so i don't ask me how many kilowatt hours a day because i can't remember um but no 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 i was just going to say so what what does it what what will that amount power for you in in the day then will it power all of your electric you know all all of your appliances and everything if we if we're clever about when we put stuff on because the one thing we haven't done is put a, a battery in so what it's meant for us is being much more aware of when we're using electricity and how much because we had smart meters put in mm. at about the same time mm um and so it means right, that okay, we're doing yeah. things like running the washing machine and running the dishwasher in the middle of the day when we're generating power off the solar rather than when it's convenient in the evenings so it's it's meant a bit of rethinking about what mm -hmm. we use when mm -hmm. because the one thing we didn't fit was a storage battery because when i looked at the economics it didn't seem like it was worth the extra investment um we might rethink that but okay. at the moment that that was what it seemed like so we thought we'll we'll, we'll see how we get on um because yeah. we've got the car that can take any surplus electricity and we're waiting for another little device an eddy for those who remember back to episode five and the interview with the tom at my energy uh we've got waiting for our eddy which will allow yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, it, it to intelligently put any spare electricity into our hot water system as well so what we're thinking is we can probably oh, use most of the electricity we're going to generate one way or another between current use hot water and car battery yeah yeah mate it does it it sounds the right way to go i mean we're we're kind of looking at we are looking at both because we kind of think that that might be the way to the way to go for for us but um, but there's lots of other things that we need to do here in our house because it's literally just so drafty and yeah. you know it's kind of making sure we keep the heat heating that we've got. We noticed during the last you know kind of obviously today's the first day that we've when it's not as cold as it has been, yeah. but during the real cold snap, it's been absolutely shocking in this house. Yeah, it isn't until you realise you know how. How, you know, once you get the cold coming through that actually I just said, look, let's just start shutting the doors because normally we used to have a cat. So we kept the kept the doors open so the cat could just come in and out because that's what we're like, you know. So so literally we're now because we lost our cat last year. Yeah. Lisa, um, but we're now kind of shutting, making sure we shut all the doors and try and keep the heat in sure. so we can maybe identify where the where the drafts are coming from the most i mean the the room that i record this in is a converted garage it's my office my husband calls it my cave it's so rude yeah. but um, <laughs> but this is this is a converted office but sorry a converted garage so i don't think it's got very much insulation right and also our right. our bedroom uh, um, our master bedroom is actually built on the top of this this room as well. So our bedroom's really cold as well. But it's trying to understand how to how we can get over that because there's no point in us investing in all these new things until actually we've be, we become a little bit you know where we're actually trapping the trapping the heat a little bit. Yeah, better, no, you know it, absolutely. It, I mean, it's definitely a progression because you know we realised the same thing because we'd had new windows. But the insulation in our roof space mm. was was still, mm. you know, back to the 1980s when the house was built. 
So another thing I've done is put, you know, modern, really thick insulation in the roof space just to keep the place warm because you're right, yeah. you've got to keep the heat in. So if we're really, you know, because I think if we're really thinking sustainability, what we've really got to think about is how much stuff we're using as much as how, how are we generating it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we so we've done it's really caused us to to rethink some of our habits. Um, you know, like we've mm -hmm. decided because mm -hmm. my wife and I both work from home a lot of the time. But we're saying for most of the day, I'm in my office, which is this little room. She's up in an, in our smallest bedroom, mm -hmm. which is her office. And the rest of the house is sitting yeah. there empty. So why heat a whole house? Right. You know, so we've invested yeah. in two little electric powered oil heaters one for each office okay because on a bright day not a dull day like today but on a reasonably bright day we're generating enough electricity to run those off the solar panels so we're not yeah. using gas during the day and we only put the main heating on mm. in the evenings when we're about the house more so that's thinking about patterns of usage as well um yeah. you know and and at some point, I need to talk to Octopus Energy, who you're with, to think if we can get a deal that gets us cheap electricity at night and various things like that. So we think about using electricity at times when it's mm. not putting such a, a drain on the network. Yeah, very true. Yeah. I, I was talking to um uh, a, a lady last week called Juliet Davenport. Right. And she... Uh, she's a chief executive of Good Energy, and she was telling me about um, an infrared heating system, or you yeah. can kind of movable heating system called Herschel. Yeah. Um, Herschel infrared um, uh, heaters. So actually, it's something that I'm. You know, <clears throat> the part of this podcast is is learning about all this stuff. Absolutely. And looking at you know doing the research that's right for us. So, so that that's something that I'd like to I'd like to look into, and and I also was listening to I don't know whether you've listened to it, this um, Harvey, but Fully Charged, which is um, Robert Llewellyn, um, who played played Crichton from Red Dwarf, who's oh, just right. one of my heroes, honestly. <laughs> but he was basically he's been running Fully Charged um, for years and years now, which is a YouTube um, it's a YouTube channel, and he has a podcast as well. But he was talking about. The, um, he'd been involved in an experiment where um, they were looking at the amount of wind coming through a house. They literally put mm. pull, full, filled this house full of wind, you know, and, and kind of blowing it through and showing that all the internal interior doors were kind of really badly fitted. And it's one of those things we've noticed recently that we kind of now we're shutting the, jo the doors more that actually we shut one and another one opens because it's just the doors are just so rubbish. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So that this stuff, it's things that, that, you know, I know the interior doors aren't going to cost as much as the windows, the exterior, you know, the windows sure. or the exterior doors. So it's something that, you know, not everybody can afford to do this. We can't afford loads and loads of stuff. So it's a matter of just doing the things that are important to you to actually become a little bit more, um, you know, keep your keep yourselves warm a bit better and, and a bit that, start that, just that. And that, that there's kind of a really interesting us. thing. You know, you say keep yourself warm because one of the one of the other bits I've learned as we've had the I three from my friend Tom, mm. who used to work, you know, like me, used to work at BMW and did a lot of work on the electric mini, mm. but that uses a lot of the same tech as right. the I three. And he said, you know, when you now you've got your I three. Having the heater on now is costing you electricity. Whereas in a diesel car, having right. the heater on in the car is just using the waste heat from the engine. So it's not costing you anything. Whereas yeah. having the heater on in an I3 means you're eating into your, your range. You're so he said, doing better that. put the electric seats on. Because then you're okay. heating the person and not all this air in the car. So if you yeah, want to get warm, put the electric seats on because yeah. that uses less power. And the same thing's true, as you said, yeah, with the yeah. infrared heating, because infrared heating is about heating the people, not heating the air. Exactly. And yes. therefore putting more yeah. clothes Which on was really is about keeping the people it? warm and not heat the air. So it's it's back to what I said about rethinking the way we're using energy to get what we want. You know, and I think if we're really thinking Very about much. sustainability, that's where we need to go. 
you know, because EV, you know, we talk, we've t- talked about EVs a lot, you know, and that's where we got started. And, you know, it's important to remember, I think, that an EV is only part of the whole system of generating and using energy, you know, because... Absolutely. It, you know, my, my daughter said to me, she said, the most, the most environmentally friendly car is the one you've already got, even if it's a dirty old diesel. Mm. Because mm. every time you bring a new car into the system, that's done a huge amount of environmental damage before you even start driving it. Mm. And with an EV, that level of environmental damage is like 50% more or, or worse. Mm. So it takes, mm. if you buy an EV, typically you've done way more damage to the environment than if you buy a diesel car at the day you pick it up. And that's something people forget. Mm. Yeah. Um, second thing. I suppose if you keep it longer. Well, keep, that's the keep challenge, it for a isn't long it? Because time. I, and I think that's back to thinking about our total use again. Because... The, they, the, the work that BMW did suggests that an EV doesn't become environmentally neutral till it's done about 60,000 miles. Right. Yeah. So up to 60,000 miles, your dirty old mm. diesel probably still done less damage to the environment than the EV. Even more so if you are buying electricity from a source that isn't clean energy. Mm. So we need to think about the whole system. Very true. So you're right. The trick here is yeah. going to be for everybody to keep their cars longer. You know, because we're long past the days mm. when cars rusted within their first five years and started falling apart, which when I was young, that's that was yeah. true. You know, I mean, my two or three year old that cars point. when I was a, an early dry, a young driver, were probably in worse condition than my 10 year old car was when I got rid of it this time last year. You know, so cars last longer. Right. Yeah. Um, and therefore, yeah, I think, we, you know, there's part of the whole sustainability thing for me is learning to not have to have a new car every three, four years, but just keeping cars yeah. in the system longer. Um, because the so much damage is done building the car in the first place in terms of getting materials out the ground you know all that energy that's used to build a car we want to keep them as long as we possibly Mm -hmm. can and you know i think the nature of car making and car buying is going to change over the next few years yeah it's funny it's funny you should it's funny you should say that so a few years ago this is i always say bc before covid yeah before covid um my my husband and my son went to a future cities exhibition uh, over in east london yeah and it was you know i i was doing something so they ended up going one weekend and actually what they were talking about what or what they were demonstrating was the future of of or you know kind of car, car use <laughs> and instead of people instead of instead of people actually having uh, a car themselves they would be like a pool car yeah as, or as in different pool cars kind of thing so so you'd you'd kind of probably be able to order a car like an uber yeah you know and it'd probably be you know autonomous vehicle kind of thing so mm-hmm. it would actually um turn up and drive you wherever you wanted but you didn't actually have a have a car yeah but, i mean Whenever that happens, I don't know. We're but probably it's, looking. It, it's at starting a lot, to happen you know, a, a bit. bit. Yeah, I mean, certainly, I've, I've got a friend who lives in Oxford, rather than it like you and I, sort of in a place outside the city. And certainly, car ownership in Oxford is actually getting quite challenging in terms of parking, in terms of driving mm. around the city. Mm. And so, his his previous car got written off in an accident. And and they decided right. not to buy a new one and to join one of these car clubs. So they're now in mm. a car club that says on the occasion they need a car, they can pick whatever's the right size and sort of car for what they want. So if they need an EV because they're doing a lot of city driving, they can get an EV. If they need something that's a big estate car because they're doing a long journey to move stuff or go on holiday or whatever, they take get a bigger car. And that's really working for them, mm. you know. But I think, I think I'm still right. one of these people who likes his own car with his own bits in it and everything else. So, 
but part of our, same. but, but that do. does remind me that part of our decision about the i3 was let most of our driving is just two of us round town need a smaller car if we want a big car for a long journey occasionally yeah. we can re we can just hire a car for a week you know so it's it is about yeah, rethinking true. what we do you know why drive a big estate car or mpv or suv for most of the time when actually all you when most of the time it's just you and a, you and a suit you and a hand baggage yeah exactly and actually if you think about it from up from the work that we do which is so your operational excellence on continuous improvement Same stuff, really but, yeah. that's what you'd be expecting to do yeah Move, moving forward it's all about continuous improvement it's actually looking at ways to improve absolutely the way the way that we do things absolutely you know and i think something that you and i would both do when we're talking to clients is to say not look at the improvement to this tiny little bit and optimize a tiny little bit of your business in ways that actually make the rest of the business less effective because it has upstream and downstream yeah. consequences but look at the whole system and say how can we make the whole system yeah. work better yeah. you know so yeah. you know if you're talking to a manufacturing company you've really got to be start thinking about everything that you're influencing from when you dig raw materials out the ground to what happens when we get to the next generation of products you know how do we mm -hmm. recover recycle reuse parts at the end of life and just look at the whole system and how we can optimize yeah, that and it's cool for me. And you know, that's how manufacturing companies are going to have to change in the sort of world i inhabit mm -hmm. and i guess similar things for the sort of clients that you'll you'll service and so that the lesson is the same for yes. all of us whether it's our professional life or our our personal energy use that we've been talking about so far i think the same principles apply mm. for sure mm. Mm. do you know it's been it's it's really interesting talking to you um, yeah just wanted to just ask you finally kind of if if people want to find you um is the best place to find you on linkedin yeah definitely or you, know, you, got a website? LinkedIn, you know i'm i'm not hugely active on social media but if i'm active anywhere it's on linkedin so that's definitely the best place LinkedIn. to find me. If you just search Harvey Leach Veracity in LinkedIn, you'll probably find me. And certainly Harvey's not a very common name in the UK. Most of the others are, are in the US. So you'll probably find me anyway, even if you forget the company name. So definitely. And uh, you can probably put a link to my LinkedIn profile in the show notes anyhow. I will do. Yeah. I will do for sure, for sure. But listen, Harvey, it's been lovely. It's been lovely to talk to you. Same here. It's just, it's nice. It's, it's nice to talk to somebody who's kind of in the same field as me, but also somebody who's that, you know, those steps a bit further forward on the on the kind of like the the journey towards net zero. You know, kind of help helping helping yourself do that. Yeah. So great to kind of get that get that information and i think hopefully everybody else would appreciate listening to somebody who's that little bit further ahead as well so yeah. but uh, but thank you thank you very much for your time my pleasure it's been been really good thanks um, liz and so to everybody else thank you very much and everyone else i shall say see you next time bye bye now you've been watching electric evolution with liz allen don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell icon and you'll receive all of our weekly videos. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye.